The Bo and Luke Show. Inspiring you to be better, know better, and do better. Welcome to The Bo and Luke Show with a diverse lineup of guests, from NFL players to CEOs. It's real and it's raw. From the Hale Media Group, here are your hosts, Robert Bo Bravo and Luke Carrington. Bo and Luke Nation in studio with us today is KC Chipwadia. He's the founder and CEO of Athlete Foundry. KC is a United States Navy captain, currently serving in the Navy Reserves. And incredibly, he was previously a NASA human space flight engineer and senior leader. I'm looking so forward to getting into that. Without question, he's had a had and continues to have an amazing professional career that even included being selected as a NASA astronaut candidate uh, interviewee uh, in 2012. Uh, that group included only 120 final interviewee candidates out of 6,500 applicants. That is an amazing statistics. That's just incredible. It's like, wow, never talked to anybody ever in my life uh, who had anything to do with the astronaut program. So this is going to be a fantastic podcast. We'll dive into all kinds of topics related to Casey's career and really get into what he and his team at Athlete Foundry uh, are doing to help middle and high school athletes achieve their dreams. You know, Luke, I think Casey has a lot in common uh, with what we're trying to do on this podcast and for the for the Bowen Luke Nation, where we want to help people be, know, and do better. Uh, I think he's doing, sounds like he's doing just that and he's spreading his uh, all that he has to share and all that he's done in his life. And he's giving that back uh, to our younger generations, which is just so incredibly powerful, uh, setting up the future. We need more people like KC. So KC, welcome to the show. Tell us about yourself. Thanks, Bo. Look, uh, it's such an uh, actual honor to be here. I love meeting other great human beings uh, that have aligned mission, which you've already explained is so well aligned with uh, the podcast and both of you uh, gentlemen. So thanks for being Thanks for allowing me to be here and share a little bit of my story. Uh, looking forward to a great discussion that, that's going to cover a good spectrum of NASA, Navy stuff, and, uh, and Athlete Foundry stuff. So uh, with that, um, love to get started. Awesome. Awesome. Now let's jump right in. I don't even know where to jump in with this, Casey. I mean, you are just, uh, by the way, just, I mean, like a fantastic human being from your background here. Um, where do we start on, I, I guess, just this? You know, the mission of KC, like what, what's what's the uh, the genesis of it all? I, I guess lay it out for us. Yeah, thanks. Good question. I I, uh, I had to find that, you know, I had to struggle with that myself for years. I'm going to, if I can, I'd like to tell you about how I got to Athlete Foundry. I think that'll help explain the why, you know, I yeah, was really absolutely. in search of that why. Um, so bear with me for a bit in this story. And uh, uh, I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur in my life. I had to connect three dots in my head that got me to Athlete Foundry. Um, and the first dot came from how to channel anger uh, and frustration at a, a something that I discovered was painfully broken. And since I was six years old, my dream was to be a United States astronaut, as you alluded to in the opening. And believe it or not, you know, many kids, millions of kids have that dream. They all change the month after month. I stuck to it. I'm, I'm a hard-headed guy. It may not be the the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm, I'm hard headed and stubborn. So I stuck with that dream uh, for decades. I did research. I, I, I did as much as I did. I, every thought process, action and decision in my life was how do I get from here to be an astronaut? There was no roadmap, no help, no insights. And as I did more research, I just started to learn that there was a lot of uh, lack of transparency. I couldn't figure this whole really mysterious puzzle out. And it was frustrating for me. Uh, and, and eventually someone said, hey, Casey, you know what? You want to be an astronaut? Go work at NASA. That makes sense. In fact, not just any NASA, but go to the one where the astronauts are headquartered in Houston. I said, wow, that makes sense. Let me go. So I had the, the privilege to be there for, for 20 years. I supported 50 space shuttle missions. I was part of the uh, what I call the unfortunate honor to be part of the Columbia Accident Investigation Team in 2003 when we lost the, uh, the crew and the shuttle on the way home. Humbling yeah. experiences for sure. Um, and I, I have friends that are astronauts still. And I asked them, Hey, please give me some insights. Uh, just give me a little tip, you know, and they would all say, Casey, I have no idea. And I thought, you know, they're just being jerks. Uh, why aren't they telling me? And turns out that they were right. Um, that in fact, it's counterintuitive. If someone asked me today, 
if they wanted to be an astronaut, should they go work at NASA? And I would say absolutely not. That's the last place to do. And it's unfortunate. It really is unfortunate. Uh, and I'll explain why that why I get there. So I kept trying and trying and trying. And every couple of years, they take applicants. So uh, the other half of my story, of course, is that I'm in the military as well, active in reserve, both 20 now, 21 years. Um, and I had a couple ground deployments, Iraq and Afghanistan. And the Iraq deployment really would fundamentally change the course of my life and derailed what I thought was being an astronaut, and that was my life's purpose uh, to make impact to kids, uh, which I've always enjoyed to do. Uh, so I continued to apply, had great experiences, uh, tough ones, uh, had several times where I never thought I'd come home, uh, fortunately to come home, and, and several of my brothers and sisters did not. But that made me self-reflect a lot. And for the first time, I had a doubt in my head, maybe astronaut wasn't my journey. So a year later, uh, I got redeployed to Afghanistan, and halfway through that deployment, I got this email of a lifetime, uh, which would have been a phone call if I was in the U.S. It said, you made it to the final rounds of interviewees of 6,500 applicants. Get your butt back to Houston somehow for the interview. So not an easy thing, as you gentlemen might imagine, from combat oh, yeah. to interview to combat. True. So a 10-day whirlwind journey. I was so grateful for my bosses in Afghanistan to let me go, which is not easy, but I made it happen as a whole chapter of a book in the future. I got a chance to peek behind the curtain, the Wizard of Oz mentality, and, and really determine was my research valid or not. And I unfortunately discovered that it was valid, that there was a lot of inequities, uh, there were a lot of lack of transparency. It was just so outdated of a process. It hadn't changed in 40 years, four decades. Wow. HR process on steroids, imagine HR. You can appreciate this. If any company organization doesn't change, the, evolve their HR in a year, let alone 40, you're irrelevant. You're done. The only place oh, you can do that is absolutely. the government and get away with it. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't make it. I wouldn't be talking to you. However, I was so angry at the fact that I worked my butt off. I did everything and more, and I didn't feel like I got a fair shake. I don't want to guarantee success in life. I don't want a magic pill of success. I just want a clear path, get out of my way. And if I don't make it, then I know it's on me. But I yeah. just want a clear, fair path. So I had to channel that anger. And my second dot is my compassion for kids. I love talking to kids, uh, middle, elementary, high school, as a NASA guy, as a Navy guy. And it's amazing, Bowen Luke, that when I talk to kids, even today, and I tell them, you too can be in the military, you too can be an officer, you too can be an engineer at NASA, many kids open their eyes and go, no, not me. I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. Look at my skin color. Look at my gender. Look at whatever it is. Sure. It is heartbreaking to hear that even today. And kids need to see people that look and speak like them. So diversity and inclusion, so powerful to me that they say, wow, if that guy can do it, by golly, I can do it. And I love that idea. And the third dot is my passion to work with groups like the military. That's my DNA. My, my dad was Army. Um, so it was, it was just uh, in the family. And after talking to a lot of veteran entrepreneurs, it, that aha moment came where I connected all, uh, which was the closest civilian counterparts to the military are athletes, team, vision, yeah. passion, focus, et cetera. So when I combined all, it made sense that the, that the group of kids in society that we're going to help, that I'm going to attach my purpose to is student athletes. These are the kids that start life's hustle early, early practice, late homework, rinse and repeat over and over. And so I knew my background in NASA, Navy, leadership, breaking problems down into simple uh, digestible elements of the first principles, uh, a systems engineering sort of mindset, and surrounding myself with great people that have the right subject matter expertise to go execute and tackle this uh, game on. So my journey began uh, about four and a half years ago with Athlete Foundry. That's awesome. You know, Casey, uh, Luke and I have found in very short order since we started this podcast a little over a month ago, there's a, there is a definite connection between, uh, between elite athletes uh, and the military and the mentality, you know, we asked, it, it, it was eye opening, really didn't expect the answer, but we asked Jared Wilson safety for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I know we probably mentioned him on every one of our podcasts since we interviewed him, but it's, it's keeping the, um, it's keeping the theme going that I think if, if we, you know, are for the listener in the car driving to work, they'll get that common theme podcast after podcast from listening to different individuals like yourself, and you tie it back to someone like Jared, who is who is an NFL player today. He's about to go. He just got a contract extension for the Jaguars, so he's going into his sixth year. And we asked him, and he played at the University of Michigan. Uh, and his senior year is when Jim Harbaugh came in. And you know, we asked him very specifically, what what is one thing you learned from 
from Jim Harbaugh, your college coach. And this is where, you know, the answer, I, I didn't expect it. I don't think Luke did. Um, out, out of all the football things you can imagine this this coach could bring to you, that he didn't, it was not a football answer whatsoever. It was, what I learned from Jim was battle rhythm. Wow. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> he, he learned battle rhythm. And then, you know, so it's like you just connected the NFL to the military in a big way out of something you learned from your coach. I mean, and, and you just said it too, right? So I think that's fantastic. So we thank you for sharing that for sure. Um, I have a question, like, why did you pick the Navy? Was there anything specific that you wanted to do in the Navy you didn't think you'd get from any of the other services? Yeah, so this is probably the cliche answer. Uh, you know, dad was Army, so um, ah. he he did certainly, uh, I think, drive me towards the Army. I was actually in the Army, JROTC, so there was this sort of Army feeling, but, um, you know, the world is 70% water, uh, yeah. and I, I got to admit, uh, I was a Top Gun kid, you know that, and so that was the, the the tipping point. The movie was the world's best recruiting tool, and still is, and so that was the driving point for me. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Well, publicly, <laughs> thank you for thank you for your service. Uh, thank um, you too. Greatly appreciate that. Yeah, no joke, Casey. Seriously, thank you for your service, man. Uh, I also hear that I've heard this from many people, but I want to know if it's true between the two of you. And I hope I don't start something here, but I heard that the Navy also has the best food as well. Uh, they don't. Yeah, <laughs> they don't. <huh? laughs> well, we we, ha we have to give them th those props to the Air Force. God bless them. Love them. <laughs> really? So the Air yeah. Force has the best food. If you're if you're going into the military for food, the Air Force is where you want to go, huh? Yes. You know, there, there's a, there's obviously the inter service rivalry, and we joke, and they have the best golf courses, etc. But uh, you know, I, I will say, admittedly, that the larger ships. Uh, aircraft carriers particularly have actually phenomenal food service, you know, from a standpoint of, of true health, uh, true diet, uh, understanding nutrition, um, along with the other, other more fatty stuff. So I'm a vegetarian, so, uh, it makes it a bit challenging for me, although these days it's oh, better sure. and better. Very nice. Yeah. I mean, just you walking us through all this is absolutely fascinating, Casey. I mean, you set your mind out to do something like become an astronaut, right? That That is daunting towards everybody else, right? That is in, absolutely incredible. So first off, hats off to you for actually doing it. What's the, I guess, what is the, walk us through like the most exciting part of that? Or is the whole process, is it, is it, because I'm imagining it's, is it, it's exciting. Is it not? Is it just more hard work? And it's just, I, I, I it's probably the latter, but I'm gonna let you answer that. You, you, are you really talking like the astronaut selection week long interview or the whole just working at NASA journey? Just the whole the whole working at NASA journey. Yeah. So that's that's actually a great question. Um, it's it was uh, kids. You know, I was a kid in a candy store every day. Uh, without a doubt, it was incredible hard work. Um, you, you know, many, many times in my journey uh, when I first got there, believe it or not, as a, as a great I, I get made fun of in the family often because when I first got, I, I, I'd interned there at NASA for a number of semesters and I was going to undergrad and graduate school. Um, so I had the pleasure of working on spacesuits pretty much that whole time, which, you know, well, how cooler could that be is to work on spacesuits, life and death, no kidding, serious stuff. And my first day as a full-time employee, uh, my boss pulls me in and says, KC, I know you've been working on spacesuits and you're, you're just, we love having you here. Uh, we're so excited and, you know, we're going to, we're going to give you an opportunity to go back to work in spaces, but I need this little help temporarily. I need you to go work on this one special project just for the short period of time. And, you know, I now know that never turned out to be a short period of time, but, um, he said, we need to go work on the sh space shuttle toilet. So oh, yeah. while that is actually fairly cool because it's the most complex toilet in the world, uh, which I did They're for four very years, important. Very, very important, important, by the way, I, I was yeah. the, uh, eventually became the, the manager for the space shuttle toilet. So there's a lot of things about the human anatomy that I can share during dinner, uh, with you guys when we get <laughs> together. So I learned more about the human body than I ever thought I knew, but as a, as a fresh new employee, I thought, Hey, I just worked on the spacesuit, and you asked me to work on the, on the crapper. Yeah. Hold on boss. <laughs> uh, but he, you know, nonetheless, um, I never went back to, to that particular suit. Uh, but I uh, had an amazing experience working on a very complex system uh, that had a number of very serious issues. As you can imagine, you're going on a road trip uh, in the U.S. and, you know, you got to go trying to find a restroom that doesn't work. It's a problem. And uh, if you're up in, in space uh, at 150 miles, uh, it's a bigger problem. So 
it actually oh, is a very a serious matter. <laughs> so, yeah, it'd be a so, disaster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. I can definitely imagine, um, and I think probably even most lay people that you know you, you've never been part of NASA, but you can absolutely imagine that everything is compounded once you're out in orbit and you're on a space and you're on a, uh, a shuttle, a space shuttle or spaceship, whatever you want to call it. And I, I can imagine that makes your job exponentially more difficult to figure out those solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Cause it's, it's, um, uh, first of all, mission success. Um, so if you have to cut the mission short, it's a massive, massive ripple effect dollars, bring the shuttle home early. I mean, it's just right. a significant issue, but safety, um, right. It's not just, Oh, I can't go pee or poop. Um, we do have obviously contingency, uh, for a short period of time bags and such for a couple of days. Um, but now you talk about safety and health in a closed environmental system that is designed to filter certain things, but uh, it can also be taxed significantly. And so the health and safety, which now then impact the pilot and co-pilot or the commander and pilot that have to land the shuttle. So there's a lot of factors that go into this. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, so then when you got to the actual interview process and going you know, to your shot at becoming an astronaut, what, what, what was that like? And, and, whatever detail you think you can, you want to share. Uh, cause I think, <laughs> I think it would just be, it's just fascinating. You know, you talked about HR, the HR antiquated process, um, that truly I agree you only get in the government. Um, it's, it, it's, it had to be, exhilar <laughs> I can see it exhilarating fun. I mean, you made it to that point. What was that like? Yeah. That, if I can, if I can back up one second, then I'll connect the dot to that question, yeah. uh, Bo, which is, uh, I won't bore you with all the other projects, you know, as I progressed through NASA and, and moved up the chain, if you will. Uh, but the the latter half <coughs> of my uh, journey was being the manager for the uh, astronaut survival um, system, the launch suit, the orange pumpkin suit, we call it. You'll see that a lot of pictures. Um, right. So that's a, that's a launch and entry system. It has uh, uh, things associated with them to jump out of the space shuttle and entry if they need to jump in the water. They have life rafts, parachute systems. Um, all of that is part of the system that I had the fortunate to, to lead with the team. Why that's important is I took over that system um, literally a month before, uh, uh, sorry, two, two to three months before the Columbia accident. Um, so here I am wow. uh, taking over the system that's supposed to save their lives, and now it did not save their life. And the scenario, because there's a billion scenarios that are not survivable, uh, right? right? We designed the system for this one little fraction. Um, after uh, Challenger, of course, so uh, it was because in Challenger wasn't there, uh, but it still felt personal to everyone that why didn't our system save it? Why didn't it work? And it was a very, very somber, tough time psychologically for uh, everyone, of course, and all of NASA, but particularly those that that like this was our system, this was our suit. Why the hell did it not save them? Um, and it was never designed for that scenario, but nonetheless, um, through that ex that uh, investigation. Um, process, the president uh, developed a presidential investigation team that tried to understand what happened with the whole process at NASA and the shuttle. Separate mm -hmm. from that was a smaller, tiny team of less than 10, actually less than five originally, that was in fact designed to look at the cockpit and the crew specifically to say, this is an opportunity for us to learn what did the astronauts, what did they do? What, what training did they kick into gear? Because we can learn from that. Even though they didn't make it, did they go to evasive measure, measures, did they put the training into action? And so we literally did a microsecond by microsecond scenario of of incident to to uh, death and to essentially separation of, of a crew from the capsule, the capsule coming apart. We had to put all that together to understand what the crew went through. That was different than what the, the big presidential team was doing at the big picture level. Obviously, a lot of experiences, um, connections with crew astronauts that were part of this team as well. Um, so a lot of emotions, uh, doing everything respectful, doing everything with tremendous, tremendous attention to detail beyond attention to detail. And there's a, meth there's a scientific method to, of course, do investigations like, just like NTSB does. Right. Um, and there's going to be difference of opinions of how we execute that. I always execute my journey with uh, the intention to learn and be objective um, and be respectful uh, always. But there's always going to be different opinions, and I had some uh, difference with uh, with some crew uh, astronauts um, uh, in, in a respectful way, of course, so we can continue to execute the mission. Fast forward to your question of the interview. Uh, that was that was in uh, 2003, right? About almost 10 years later, 
so I get to uh, the interview itself. It's a it's a four day process. Um, you know, I, my particular group we had ten of us, so we became really good close friends. We still are because uh, we had this experience together. Sure. All from different walks of life. It was fascinating to meet these people who are way smarter than I am. All these extra degrees, um, and so it's a very actually you know we did sign an NDA, but but there's really kind of like nothing super secret about it. It's it's uh, interesting um, that we go through medical tests. There's a psychological tests, uh, which was a relatively new thing they added, um, and and then there's a couple of tours that they walk you through. They give you time to meet with other astronauts who obviously, as you know, any conversation is an interview every time. Um, and so you have to be mindful of that when you talk to other astronauts because uh, they're kind of judging you as well. And the key of the interview process that's well documented for decades, it still remains that way, which blows my mind away, is this one hour interview that everyone stresses about where you're literally sitting in a room with a whole room full of majority astronauts and uh, and then some senior leaders from Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center, some senior executives, HR professionals um, that are all sitting there. And the idea is they say, okay, Casey, tell me who you are. And they literally ask you no questions. And they and the idea is you have an hour to talk about who you are. You decide what you want to touch on, what you don't want to touch on. So hopefully you don't spend 60, 40, 55 minutes on elementary school because um, right. it doesn't tell them anything. And you at the end, if there's a little bit of time, they may ask you some questions. But that's really it. So you know, you really don't know what's important. Where do you want to touch? How do you want to navigate this journey? Um, and I, I shared the story uh, of who I am. I, I practice, I prepared, um, I prepared some, some stories, you know, stories are resonating with people. So when you can share something through a story, it's more powerful. Um, I did, I felt I did, you know, personally, I felt I did awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously I'm fairly, I didn't make it. So I did awesome. Uh, but at the end, it was interesting, and I never, I haven't shared this publicly, um, and I, and I, I obviously won't say the names, but um, I think it's worth it because I'm so still um, angry, and can I say I'm happily angry? I guess I'm angry still at the process that the question was interesting. I got done, and the first question I got was related to a disagreement from ten years ago. Really? Tell me how stupid that is about wow. about and it was from the person that that wasn't the one I had disagreement but the the yeah. fact of the matter is I have dedicated my life to human space flight and safety of crew and always launching them with safety I had a yeah. seat at the table to determine a vote for launch and I always voted with safety every single time um, and that wasn't necessarily congruent with with others um, who had kind of the go fever I mean everyone right. had good and well intentions but the question came and I knew exactly what it was connected to. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. This is what you're asking me from 10 years ago, a disagreement that I felt passionate about to do the right thing. That's yeah. what you're going to judge me on. Okay. I got it. Wow. So wow. That, that was how I ended. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Casey, rewinding a little bit. Uh, tell me, you know, going through a tragedy, you know, like you did and, and what you witnessed and for something that you worked on. What did you do, you know, emotionally and psychologically to overcome that, like as it was happening and then and then really get back to work? Like, because I feel like, you know, myself included and even Bo and our listeners out there, we're going through things on a daily basis that aren't necessarily to that magnitude. But I think that we can learn a lot from you because obviously, you know, you've been through it and handled those emotions. Uh, I guess walk us through how you successfully you know, dealt with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to answer that in, in both the Navy and a, and a NASA answer, if I may. Please, yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the NASA answer, which is your specific question, <coughs> um, I'll, I'll just share the story of where I was. I was in, in mission control um, in the early, early morning. It was an early morning landing at Kennedy Space Center. I was at, at where my team would be at, in Johnson Space Center in Houston in mission control. And we're monitoring. We know exactly the process for the landing, where the, where the queues will come in, where the crew will report their statuses and everything was going great. It was something like a four in the morning, five in the morning, Houston time. And, um, uh, the crew is beginning their descent. Uh, so we're now recognizing, you know, there's a very scientific diet down to the microsecond of when they're supposed to be at a certain spot and when they report. So everything was going great. And all of a sudden at a, at a uh, particular point of comm check, 
uh, we did not get a comp check and you can, uh, um, certainly Bo can appreciate this, uh, you know, military, you go out on a patrol and you don't report a comp check. That's a problem. Um, yep. and so mm -hmm. immediately the flag, you know, my heart sort of started to trying to figure out what, what's going on. Do we have a, is there a video freeze? What's happening here? Um, everyone is talking, we're eating breakfast. And all of a sudden I said, Hey, everyone quit it. Stop. Something's not right. Everyone be quiet for a minute. Um, and so all of a sudden you can just, you can hear pin drop because we don't get the crew's response and I can get in chills as I'm talking about it now. And, and the, the video feed goes to Kennedy space center that the landing facility and everyone is sort of trying to understand what is happening. There's no comm check. They're going over and over and over and we're not getting it back. We're not getting it back. And probably within 60 seconds, um, CNN pops up. And of course, CNN uh, at the time, I um, uh, forgot the gentleman's name now, uh, who's the space, uh, the space guy at CNN, uh, comes online. Of course, they break whatever feed they're doing, and they're saying NASA just reports the space shuttle is, uh, has not responded in calm. And you know, we hadn't heard anything yet <clears throat> within another probably couple of minutes. Um, so the time is ticking. We know landing spot, and we know when they're supposed to show up in, at Kennedy Space Center up above, and they're not there. And, and clearly everyone's trying to, trying to really, at the first moment, we're trying to say, this cannot be, this really cannot be, it must be a mistake. It must be a mistake. And, uh, all of a sudden time comes, time comes landing time, precise landing time. And it's empty. There is nothing in Florida and everyone's heart drops. Um, everyone's heart drops and trying to understand what's happened. And then within a minute or two, I think we get reports from Texas over Texas, where the majority of the uh, shuttle uh, uh, components were, were being found, you know, there's a, a, a eyewitness view of the streaking, uh, streaking sky, um, of the shuttle. And of course, first of all is, well, no, that can't be the shuttle. Is it the shuttle? I don't know. Um, so it, it was somber. It was, um, painful. Um, and, and I mean, I, 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 I literally can feel my heart pop out of my chest, um, yeah. I, I will tell you the professionalism of the team, including the leadership team there, <clears throat> um, immediately, literally immediately began executing the procedure for this, right? We have these procedures just like in the military. We go to lockdown, we go to in, no, in, no external communications, no one, no, all the phones are dead. Uh, no one can call out, um, because we want to control the, 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 the rumor mill, if you will, for now. Sure. Um, and literally we begin I can, I can tell you this, I'm walked down to the main conference room with the, and the boss, uh, the big boss is already creating a fault tree. Uh, I mean, that's the level of understanding of what the next thing we need to do is, okay, our job is under, you know, begin the understanding of the failure, uh, while there's a separate team that was preparing to launch, uh, on bus, on foot in car to, uh, mid, uh, to Texas to start to create. To, to, to create a command post. So, you know, activating the National Guard, activating NASA, activating the local police in that area. I mean, everyone came to town. I mean, it was just absolutely one of those amazing American moments. Wow. What a, yeah, that's, um, that's almost even hard to respond to. It, it, it brings me back yes. to um, even the days of, uh, of 9-11 uh, and, and I was in my first tour at the White House and, and you're watching this unfold and and it's those very same types of feelings that you're like this 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 is not happening right but but it really is happening and then it's the you know it's the response in the minutes and hours and things that that uh that happen next and and how and how do you actually take how do you deal with it um yeah 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 uh, and i think as luke said uh your question of how do you deal with it from from that story um and I think this, this goes to perhaps what Bo was also sort of suggesting is at the moment in time, you don't have time to think that right. um, it, it's, you, you have to mm -hmm. spring into action. So I think that there's a moment of, of just go, 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 and not really worried about the emotions at the moment because we have a job at mission. And I, I think the difference is if you're physically on scene, there's a different response perhaps than when you feel disconnected. Cause I'm seeing it on TV. I don't feel like I'm really there maybe. Um, the uh, the military example of of which there's many, but I can tell you the first one is when I, uh, being a ship guy, uh, first ground deployment in Iraq, you know, different kind of helping the army do army job uh, stuff, and my first literally first two days in Baghdad, 
set day two, I uh, walked to my, we call it the, the, the hooch, the chew. Uh, mm-hmm. And so um, I walk into uh, the chew and um, I hear this, this uh, whizzing sound coming towards me. The alarms go off. Uh, first uh, missile attack, uh, you know, uh, regular every couple of days, of course, but my first one, <laughs> um, being a ship guy going, what the hell is that? And the alarms go off. And of course, we're trained to you know, drop and put our armor over us. And it literally goes right over my head, um, literally wow. right over my head, lands just on the outside of the wire, huge explosion. Um, uh, it wasn't somewhere in the distance. It was over me and it could have landed, of course, on me. And, and uh, that moment was defining for me because I did have to ask myself, I might not walk my daughters down the aisle. Am I OK with that? Wow. And I had a hard time answering that question. Um, and I quickly uh, had to make the decision. There's two types of people, uh, those that that uh, experience will consume them and the rest of the deployment will be consumed by that or those that say whatever however i left it i am very content i'm um i I left my family in the best position i felt i could and um i have to go execute the mission the the job is at stake at hand and so i i chose the latter because um literally every couple days more and more came and you know at some point uh i i they train us to fall drop and then put the armor on top of us that all kind of went by the wayside, you know, the alarm went off and I just turned the other way and went, went back to sleep and said, if it's my day, it's my day. Um, but that was sort of the decision point I had to make. Yeah, I, I, that is fantastic. And I think that is a great, um, segue, uh, because bringing up, a, um, a comment that, uh, I had, uh, the gentleman's name's Mike Barger. He wrote the forward for my, my recent book and he was a Navy, he was a Navy top gun chief instructor, fighter pilot, Top Gun chief instructor, um, and he was co-founder of JetBlue uh, Airways. And oh. in the forward, he talks about when we talk about like military, the, the experience of military leadership and 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 what you go through. And, and he used an acronym called uh, VUCA for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous times. And you experienced those <laughs> at NASA. You definitely experienced those. Well, when it's you're, my life. When Wait, right? Yeah, it's life. <laughs> But but you either but you choose and you you just explained it. You have to choose. You make a choice, right, on how you're going to deal with that. So, leading into um, your leadership philosophy that you have uh, posted, um, very very, uh, I find a, a lot of uh, value in it. And you, it's lead by example from the front with ethics, integrity, purpose, and impact. Taking your your background uh, from the Navy and all of your experiences there and with NASA. And you're obviously your leadership philosophy. How are you taking that into Athlete Foundry as an entrepreneur? How is that impacting your journey over the last four years since you've founded um, your company? Um, and how how are you using that internally with every, whether it's internal or external vendors that you work with? How are you using those experiences to to deal with what you're dealing with now? And, and it's very it's not military guys, but it's it's still elite young athletes, their parents. Uh, I, I would imagine, I would imagine the complexities are are there. Um, how how do you respond to that? Yeah, thanks, Bo. And I think the uh, there's an external factor and an internal factor. The the external, uh, you know, we're a uh, for for the time being, at least right now, we're, it'll eventually evolve certainly. But we're a SaaS based company, so software as a service, so subscription mm-hmm. based. So right at the moment, at least based on the stage of our company, very little interaction. Uh, personal interaction with our customers, but the key there is um, to an- your the answer to your question more is I think more internally facing, but <laughs> externally is to ensure that we come across professional. We come across uh, not like a fly by night operation, which we're not. So how do I communicate our our um, strong position as a company to those that are interested to learn? In these days, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Um, recently more, we have to combat more of fake scams, uh, fishy stuff going on. Is it real? Is it not real? Are these guys faking it? Um, it, it's hard for people. Everyone is coming at it with those, such a skeptical eye of anything. And until athlete foundry truly has brand recognition, trust and credibility is an ongoing development process. And I have, how do I build trust and credibility? Because people's 
and children's, their families' lives, our future is what we're selling uh, on yeah. the platform. So how, it's not just selling a cup or a mug and they say, I don't like it, I'll just return it. It's a different transaction. It's a, it's a very tough challenge to do. And I felt that the important thing to do is I, what I can start with is present a very professional front. Um, and in our website, you can, you can certainly see that I have added a CEO pledge and that is not a common yeah. thing. And in that pledge, I, I make it very clear to them and they can read my bio and everything sure. uh, in our teams to know that I am a real, I'm, I'm legit. Um, and I'm, I, the best I can do is live my life the way that I uh, live my life uh, in uniform as well. Uh, they can be assured of that. Um, internally, it's even probably more important right now because uh, as a small lean team, how do I ensure that I execute speed uh, while maintaining um, professionalism, coordination, diversity? Um, and I love one of the, sure. the, the one of the great books recently, uh, what a couple of years ago was Team of Teams, um, certainly yep. from a crystal great book. Love the stories in that book. Uh, very true. Um, and that's just who I am, even for, for, from NASA. It's always about ensuring that uh, we get everyone's insights and inputs. They see that I behave a certain way and that I hold them accountable. Um, and, and I will. And I do hold everyone accountable. I have consistency in my processes internally. In fact, the Athlete Foundry internally is a design of civilian and military terminology. In fact, we have battle rhythm in our company yeah. as well. And so uh, the team knows it. The team knows lines of effort, LOE. They know um, AOR. Um, <laughs> so there's certain terminologies that are internal to our team. And I hold everyone accountable. And they see that I hold myself uh, accountable. And I'm not ashamed of, of them calling me out. Um, and I sure. ask them to call me out if they need to. So um, it's just how we present ourselves. That's great. Hey, Casey, it, from looking at uh, – your site here as well with athlete foundry which by the way i absolutely love what you're doing here thank you uh w one thing that jumped out at me that that i'd love for you to touch on is that when you're talking about bringing up student athletes especially from the parent parental side of things when you look at you know how your how your company is doing this what i'm seeing is and tell me if i'm wrong is like only one third of the equation here is athletic you have the academic and then the human side that goes into it as well. And it looks like you're putting just as much weight on that. Do you think that in our society right now, parents are putting way too much emphasis on the physical side and then ignoring those other sides? And I guess what can our listeners do to be, you know, really mindful of that and to, um, you know, set up our kids for success, even if the physical side doesn't work out? Mm. Yeah, thank you. I, I so yeah, our our model is def, is uh, defined by those three pillars. Uh, we call every child is every single child is broken in those three pillars. Every human is actually uh, athletic, academic, and human, and that then we deconstruct that uh, into those things that are shown on our website. Um, so I, I should say I, <coughs> I should say first, what we do is we give parents and student athletes a sixth through twelfth grade roadmap that lets them build what we call their most comprehensive athumademic resume, which is athletic, human, and academic all combined in a unified model that does three things. One, increase their odds uh, to be a student athlete. Uh, two, improve their college financial assistance potential. When a college sees that you focus on all three of your elements, all of you, they actually will do their very best to give you the best financial package because they have a lot of combinations of things they can put together from state, local, federal level. Um, and they want to see that if you bring the full package, they will actually give you the best financial uh, support that they can. And the third, and more importantly, helping them improve their success for life after sports. Uh, they will Eventually, sports will end. How do I prepare you to be a productive citizen in society and strengthen the fabric of America? And that doesn't come, which unfortunately, the preponderance, preponderance of thought is, I'll kick the can down the road. I'll wait until I get there. The common term, as humans, we are all typically designed to be lazy. It takes energy to move forward. So we... We, uh, we say, oh, I, I know I've got to do something. I'll worry about it when I graduate. I'll worry about it when I get to senior year. I'll worry about it when I get to a uh, year before graduating college. Um, that's not the time. That's when, unfortunately, most people do wait. And so many student athletes who have tremendous potential and, and energy to give society end college and say, you know what? I really didn't want to major in that thing. I just did it because I had to play there or because I kind of coach got hinted me. There's a lot of that, and they don't, they're not excited. They go back to their hometown, and they don't really – pursue the rest of their vision and, and energy, um, unfortunately, to give back to society. So the idea is, let's have a balanced approach that says, 
you need to have an athletic passion. I'm not arguing that, but you also can have a non-athletic passion that complements this athletic passion at the same time. Is it hard? Yes. Is it possible? Absolutely. And that's what we aim to do is to help step back. We don't replace the coach or the teacher or anyone in the ecosystem that helps you. But at the center of our business model is the family, is the parent, student, athlete. And we step back and help you unify this journey. Think of it as sort of a mission control for the parents. Wow. So is it harder to get through to the parents than it is to the kids? It is. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and and we're, we're trying to crack a lot of paradigms. And it's hard, as you know, behavioral sure. change is hard. And so parents say, um, great, Casey. I get it. I love that. Um, and, and, uh, either they're going to say rock on, let's go game on. I'm, 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 I'm engaged with the platform or, Hey, I'm already know what I'm doing. Um, or the most common one of course is my coach is going to help me. And it's a, and, and there are hundreds of thousands of coaches across America. They're all designed differently. And I've heard, I've had too many stories in our research that the, 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 the coaches are just not that they mean well, but they're just not the best coach, um, and a holistic approach. They're not the right people. And it's really just wrong to office to put the burden on the coach's shoulder that's the parent's job not the coach's job so it it is hard to get through them uh, but i'm determined and i know we will that's amazing it is amazing i think it 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 is so tied and i think this is one of the things that fascinated me uh about your story and what you're doing with athlete foundry uh we've you know we've launched um we've launched a company hail ventures and consulting uh with with our nfl agent um uh, contact or, or, or friend in our network. And one of the components of that is, is the second it's second careers for athletes. Uh, yes. But yes. what you're doing, if, if you can get them to think about that and that's this component of athlete foundry and your software, um, where you're talking about, you know, there's life, there's, there's absolutely life after you, even if you, if you're one of the fortunate ones to make it to the professional level, um, there's, that career, uh, for the most part, is very short-lived. Um, for most professional athletes, it's a few years, depending on the sport. Uh, there's got to be something after that. So if, if they've had that education through through this type of platform, you know that all of this and the academics matter just as much as the uh, the at, the athletics matter. Um, that that could be pretty powerful. Uh, it's a powerful journey to to set them on, you know, at a young age. So it's it's not new to them, and then they have some type of future, and they have goals, and they they you know even if that's going back to school because you didn't get the degree you wanted, um, because the school only allowed you to do certain things based upon your your training schedule for your sport, you, you know the the sooner they get educated on that and and motivated about that, the better. So I I think it's fantastic what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> excuse me, absolutely, Bo, and I think that. The, you know, what we want to do is, is about this, which is bread and butter to the military is planning, the classic term of, of good planning. So we, everything we do in the platform um, in terms of solution that we provide, data we provide is always what's the end state. And then I, re, I, we break it down and we reverse plan it back to sixth grade and we integrate that right into your roadmap. So it's all small, bite-sized, executable steps that yeah. are manageable for the parents and student athletes and ideas early on sixth grade to seventh or eighth, or maybe even ninth, right? The parents are a little bit more engaged in the platform. And then there's just sort of switch over where the student athlete sort of becomes more of the engagement person in the platform. But we're a couple of things. We're, we're really about option building. We want you to build options. So everything we do in the platform uh, is not only reverse plan, but we don't tell you, which m- many of the other companies, we're not a recruiter. I right? intentionally uh, made the decision so that Athfire is not a recruiter but the closest right. competitors to us are recruiters online. And then many of them sort of really focus on um, the, the top performers and kind of sort of tell you based on what your performance is, you should kind of go to this school. And, and I take a different approach. One, I believe that that's the wrong approach because 7% national average go on to college athletics. 93% don't. In our research, we found that at least half, half of the 93% actually want a path to college athletics. But for so many bad reasons, they don't. The, the kids know when the coach doesn't pick them to spend extra time with. If you're the number three on the roster or the 10th on the roster, I don't care where you are. Life is 80% mental success. If you've made the commitment decision that we've, we've talked to these kids and say, yeah, I would have loved to. But, you know, for these reasons, um, I just felt like I wasn't going to do it and, or I wasn't good yeah. today. So don't worry about what you are today. You have time to develop yourself. 
what is in your control, and that's what you should execute. And guess what? Of all the things in our model, stats is like one of 14 yeah. elements. It's a tiny fraction of what uh, is actually defining you. And yet everyone's all about stats. We have interviewed a number of collegiate coaches, and we've asked them, from a scale of zero to five, how do you value stats when you interview a candidate? Now, there's going to be some exceptions, like the, the super, super top D ones. They have different uh, importance factors. But right. for the 95% of colleges with athletic programs, there's 1,918 in our database. The answer was two. They wow. value stats, two. Because to them, their, their decision is about de-risking. Why should I pick this kid for my program? Is this kid going to study? Is this kid going to get up? Is he going to put or her put more burden on my staff? They have a program. They've spent so much time in that coach's program. And you can't, you know, you're, you're going to come into that program and they're going to mold you the way they want to mold you. Are you moldable is the question. They yeah. need to answer that question. Not about your stats. The stats is great. It's there, but it's apples and oranges. You know, you can be the rock star in small town, Louisiana, and be average in LA and the average LA may be the better person because the competition level is different. So right. they really recognize that you cannot just compare like that. They are basically trying to determine how do I pick this human and how do I know that this human is going to be a good candidate for my program? So that's really important. Right. We don't, we don't talk scholarships and we don't talk pro. That's not us. We say, follow the dream. The money will come. The dream is to have the privilege to be a collegiate athlete because there are life benefits that actually come from being a collegiate athlete. Sure. Yeah. You know, Case, what I really love about this and in, in what you're doing is there's if you follow the platform, there's really no failure from this. So let's say that even even if you don't make it to become a college athlete, if you're working with your parents and they're investing that time with you, you're going to be more disciplined. You're going to have a better emotional connection and know your parents better. And you're going to find out a lot more discipline about yourself. So even if you don't hit that goal, what just what makes me fall in love with this platform is that there is no failure from it if you follow it. And from looking at your website here, it, it's free to start. It's free. Why would somebody not do this? Exactly. And I, yeah, thank you, Luke. You, you point out some fantastic points, which is uh, at the end of the day, we believe too that whether you off-ramp at the end of 12th grade, you say, I'm not going to write the options are I go to military, I go to I enter society as a, as a worker, I go to college, I, whatever that is, Wherever you off ramp, it's a win win. We're going to have you pre better prepared to be successful, absolutely, undoubtedly. And you're you're spot on with the free perspective. Is why would you not? Um, you know, it's amazing. I've, I've I've been trying to do more digging. I've been doing lots of years of research of um, of the the buyer psychology, and it's interesting that the human we are we're we're irrational buyers. We we know that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's the parent, even the low-income parent has no problem spending $5 on a Frappuccino every day, but yep. for less than 50 cents for their kid's future, oh, wait a second, that's too much. Well, hold on a second. That's what I'm offering. For the your kid's future, are you telling me that to achieve the American dream and help your kid's future, you're unwilling to go from a Frappuccino to a a, a, a black coffee so you can use that 50 cents? And of course, as you say, right, we want to make it... We've done research. I have talked to low-income parents. I've talked to middle. I've talked to, to, to wealthy. We have done the research, and we know that, that our price range is very, very fair. So sixth grade is free. Get you on. Seventh and eighth is fourteen ninety nine a month, which is absolutely, for the value of what you get in the platform, mission control is absolutely low, low dollars. And then twenty four ninety nine for ninth uh, through twelfth, which is still, at the end of the day, less than a dollar a day. Um, we're so excited. Uh, and so, you know, actually with that, I'll say, um, we're so excited about that, that model. We've actually just recently kicked off an even more exciting initiative where we're piloting with school districts to partner yeah. with districts. And yeah. what we've awesome. actually done is say the first five school districts to partner with us, get our platform free for life. They're in, all their kids are coming in. So that district that will serve the next kids, the next kid, what value, I mean, you how can you say, no, it's a no risk. Um, so we're excited. We've already partnered with one. We've got uh, three others that are in the pipeline. So I have two slots left uh, and we're just psyched. And we had a number of interests, but uh, of course, with the recent coronavirus, um, it's hard to get in touch with the district leadership and spring break. So uh, I'm confident we're going to get that. And, and I'm so excited about the opportunity that we're going to present and give to districts. Yeah, so listeners, jump on this. Come on. Absolutely, <laughs> jump on it. I see this, I see this as something that uh, as soon as you get the um, 
as you continue to build the traction, it's going it, to, it just seems like it would be the thing that explodes. That's right. And because you're right. I mean, that the value, the price, uh, the price point, just listening to everything that you've talked about seems incredibly, incredibly competitive. Uh, so it, it, it's almost like a no brainer. And I, I even seen this have, having a daughter that went through the whole West Point um, mm. application <laughs> process and, and, you know, everything that our service academies look for in, in candidates, uh, aside from, you know, and they want to see people who were, who were athletes and the captain on their sports teams and creating that whole candidate kind of whole person concept where, you know, you got that all documented from the, I mean, what you're offering is saying you, you document things like that through this platform from the time you were in sixth grade. Right. That's so right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we, we let you, you know, there's the, obviously the, we can get into a lot of the stuff of the platform. There's a lot oh, of yeah. uh, mission control stuff. It really gets into that allows you to tell that. And I think uh, one thing that, that a uh, number of things that come to mind, if I can share is the, what no, there's no other platform in, in our research that does exactly what we do. We sit at the nexus of athletic and education in the center, and there's nothing that really does what we do in, in a new way. Um, in a, in an interesting way. So what we found is, you know, 90% of the colleges across America have less than 20,000 recruiting budget. They do not have, a, they can't afford to try yeah. new spaces. So what they do is they go to the same watering holes because they can't risk not recruiting. So they look at America through a straw hole and they really aren't looking at all the fish in the sea. Well, guess what? The, the, unless you're the top 0.1% in, in, uh, in terms of the next Michael Jordan, et cetera, which God bless him. That's great. But the vast majority of, of, of kids are going to be in the center, huge bulk, great intention, hard workers, you know, are good group to great performers, but they're not able to tell their story, right? Again, stats is a misleading thing. How sure. do I tell this someone, my story, my story is if I start to collect data from sixth grade on, or whenever you onboard, what we do is we let you through the platform communicate past progress, current value, and therefore future potential. And that those three things translate to a trend line. And what we've talked to yeah. collegiate coaches and they say, look, if a kid comes to me and says, coach, I may not be the number one, number two, number three, number four on my team, but man, look at where I came from. Look at the improvement that I've made consistently. I'm showing you my commitment of what's in my control, which is my skills, my athleticism, my, my academics, my human side. And I can, and with, we have a special um, uh, registration element with collegiate coaches and their staff is that they actually get an extra poke uh, uh, view into the kid's account with the parent approval is they actually get a chance to see the history. We let them poke into the history and now a coach can actually see that commitment and say, yes, I can see the progress. I can work with you. And every coach we've talked to and interviewed said, I will take that all day long over the rock star. You're blowing my mind right now, Casey. Yeah. Like seriously, it's uh, capturing that human, the human element data that you're providing to organizations out there and programs is I, I probably the missing link that they haven't had in in history. Yeah. Right? Like just, <laughs> it's like leave it to a NASA guy to figure this out. Yeah, he's taking because because to, uh... go ahead. Oh, because I was gonna say I was gonna say because even me. Again, like I said, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but but I, I can if I can communicate to someone, hey man, look, I, I've been at this for a while. I'm a hard worker. I can show it to you. Can you please use that in your decision making process and not just the snapshot of today? And what today's resumes do is a snapshot. I want to peek behind the curtain and know we are the first platform to let you build that story to peek behind the curtain um, and actually communicate. Um, from, from that perspective to anyone. And, and so, you know, you may be the, the rock star until 11th or 10th grade, and let's say an injury happens. Well, did you plan for that? And we've talked to kids again, and the answer is no, I didn't plan. Well, that's why our platform is we give you from division one down to junior college, the full spectrum, because life is not over. There's a spot for you somewhere. You can continue your dream. Um, don't worry about it. Just press on. And, and we want to help you with that. That's why we don't vector them in a particular direction. Cause you know, no one died and made us God and said, you should go to the school. Um, right. What is your dream? And let's help you get there to the best ability of what's in your control. And what's in your control, for example, athletically is your ability to create your athletic ability, your actual skills. Stats is not your control. You may not play a game, et cetera, but man, skills, I can work on that all day long and improve myself. Um, and so how do we communicate that piece? And that's the, that's the piece that I shared with you is that we have this unique view if you're registered at the athletic department staff 
uh, to actually look back and truly understand this individual's commitment across those three pillars. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Luke, Luke Casey is taking me back to 14 years old. Nine, <laughs> nine, yes. nine. I wish I'd had Athlete Foundry and all of Casey's wisdom then, because that, you know, it's funny when you can take something and then really make it personal. That, mm. that, you know, that, that exact thing happened to me. Right. It was baseball. And I had started baseball when I was five years old, little league and, um, all the way through eighth grade. And I, I had I had transitioned through multiple positions, but then it was pitching. And by the time I was like 12, 13 years old, I was pitching no hitters. And then wow. and I just loved baseball. And then we got to high school and that was where two towns came together, right? So now you have kids that have been competing against right. each other in a different league format. But now at high school, you're all competing. You're, you're on the same, you're competing for the same positions on the same team. And the coach the coach was from the, the, the district where I competed against. And when the end of the tryouts um, ended and he made his cuts, it was so obvious, like 95% of the kids that made the team were from the district. He, the kids he knew and they were from his district. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And, and so uh, honestly, that was it for me. I never played baseball again. I'm like, wow, I really? You don't have what it, yeah. And, and I didn't have anybody <sighs> saying, you know what? keep going, keep playing, keep, Mm. you know, this is just one season, keep training all of those types of things, because there's a place for you. You have the skills, just keep at it. Next year could be different. Right. That's right. That's yeah. So that's absolutely right. You know, that happens to kids keeps happening and happening to, Hey, you know what, Luke, I'm sorry, Bo, your story is actually spread across America, spread across America. Absolutely is. I had a kid last year I interviewed. Uh, he's Houston, plays tennis, loves tennis. And uh, unfortunately, you know, he wasn't getting the attention, etc. He wasn't the number one or two. And he knew that. And I, uh, I mean, he shared his st- a tennis story. And I said, you know, do, do you want to play in college? He said, yeah, but, but you know, X, Y, Z reasons uh, I'm not playing because I didn't make it to the top two. And so I said, well, so you're not playing. There's many other things that you still need to do in skills and practice on your own, like take charge. Yeah. Well, he did. He doesn't know. He doesn't know, um, and he gave it up. It just broke my heart. Um, it really yeah, did. It like, does. what are you talking about, man? So it's just unfortunate. And, and so we really do want to make sure that they're empowered and they know that that there's more in their control than they think. Um, absolutely. And so um, there's so many other things in the platform that help them make those decisions, including for the parents in the colleges, for example. We where we also give them. Amongst many things in college, decision making is safety. Uh, is to I have two daughters, I have three kids, two daughters, and so that's a very important piece to me. So we offer the parents and a true depth of uh, campus safety. Just because I have a cool mascot, but if my uh, violence against women or hate crimes um, um, on and off campus is high, I'm not going to send my child there. Why would I risk it? Um, yeah. So we that's one of many things that go into the this decision making process um, is to make that smart decision uh, for your child at the end of the day. I, I wanted to ask, this is an observation that I've seen. I'm sure you're way more, more, way more familiar with it than I am, but I don't think that new parents are really aware of what's going on on the, uh, I call it almost the luxury or high-end uh, sports right now for kids. So let me give you a couple of examples. So I've seen what's going on like in the Washington, D.C. area right now, especially around sports like soccer. They have these major sports complexes. Parents are showing up putting thousands and thousands of dollars. The competition is fierce uh, out there in D.C., and I'm sure it's like that in major areas around the country right now. On, you know, in Atlanta specifically right now, and I know these leagues are popping up all over the country, uh, they have leagues that actually are no-hit passing-only leagues. This one specifically in Atlanta actually just produced uh, Justin Field and uh, Trevor Lawrence. And they're playing in these summer leagues, passing only. And if it looks like, you know, on TV that they're crushing the competition, it's because it's true because they've seen 4,000 more passes in their high school career than anybody else ever did. Is this giving kids, is this helping or hurting sports in your opinion? Wow. Um, And I truly, you you know, um, read about it, heard about it, certainly, but uh, to the, to not to the to the extent that it continues to grow. And I would say to, to, uh, depends on, I, I think from the, from a kid's perspective, I will say two approaches. One is if it's a, if it's a safety related decision, 
then one can't argue that it's that it could be you know is better for the child um, sure. if it's a safety related thing like a like those cases where there's a there's flag only no tackle for a certain until you get to a certain age um, yep. as an example I'm all about that by the way yeah I, I think, think that's a good idea the other approach uh, if if, this, if it's a non safety related then um, then I'm not I, I question why uh, then to me my my opinion is it actually will hurt um, uh, if because now you're changing the game dynamics. Right, and yeah. and because you're changing game dynamics, are you truly preparing them for the game in college? Because college doesn't play that way. So are you really preparing? You know, as, as the old saying uh, goes, you know, you train like you prepare, prepare for like you train, uh, or in, in the military, you know, train like you fight, fight like you train. Well, you're not training like you're going to fight. So um, if it's a safety thing, game on. If it's a non-safety thing, um, I would question it. Awesome. Yeah, because I was thinking about it as I'm looking through your site and what you're doing with Athlete Foundry, uh, you know, and I kept getting locked on, like, why wouldn't somebody pay that price? Right. And then my mind immediately went over to, well, wait a minute, like in every major city across the country, they're paying unbelievable, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars a year mm, yeah. just to support their children through athletics That's right, right now. But are they doing it the correct way? Are they getting the best result for no. that? So I'll tell you this, it's, it's an interesting zinger, I think, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to say it. And I believe it because I say it. So, <laughs> which is, which yes. is, you know, that's great. I nothing against those parents. I, you know, great for them that they're able to do that. But guess what? That truly still is a small fraction of the population of kids across America. There's 17 million kids that play competitive sports between ages of 11 and 18 across America. That's sixth through 12th grade. 17 million. 60 percent national average play. Uh, um, uh, of, of the sorry, that's 17 million, which is 60 percent of the, all the kids. So national average is 60 percent that play competitive sports. That's the 17 million uh, that play. Um, the uh, there's so many kids, and I've driven across America that are just in these small towns and pockets that are stuck. That feel like, hey, that kid in D.C. that had that stadium, that had the the program you just mentioned, Luke. Boy, I, there's no way I could compete against that. There's just absolutely no way. And Nothing out there is going to be able to communicate to the coach, a coach that I'm interested, that I too can work hard. I too can do these things. I'm just not given the resources. That what you mentioned is in fact documented in so many articles. Time magazine last year had a the, the gap between the have and have nots in youth athletics is widening and widening and widening. It the right, playing field insane. is not level. My vision and our purpose at Athlete Foundry is to level that playing field. That says you can be a small kid in Louisiana, and guess what? by you knowing there's more in your control than just the stat thing will actually let you out compete the 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 person that's in DC that has that privilege that has that stadium that has that uh that uh, incredible stat because it doesn't matter Casey can you I I'm fascinated by you by the way but can you I I want you to get up on a soapbox for a little bit and for our listeners just address our listeners and talk a little bit about your battle rhythm and what they can do like right now, like right when they stop listening or while they're listening, what can they start doing in their daily routine, their own battle rhythm to, to be better and do better now for themselves and their, I'm just going to let you stand and take it wherever you want to go, but how can we be better? Ooh, I love that. Uh, the, uh, I have a personal battle rhythm, my, my company battle rhythm and the, my life battle rhythm and my family one. And of course they probably would like to not have a family battle rhythm, but they do. Um, but, but I think first step I would uh, suggest to those um, is to truly think about creating a battle rhythm for themselves, even though they may think they have one is to really reflect back and say, do I truly have one? Meaning, yes, I go to, I get up, I go to work, I come home, but then what, then what, then when the real battle rhythm is really a test um, is what do I do when I come home um, is, is that routine that I have, um, that integrates a little bit of uh, me time, a little bit of self uh, growth mindset. Um, where am I learning? So I'm not stale at my own uh, at my own growth as a parent. Um, spending time with the with the kids. I know it's challenge. It is tough. They have their own things going on. They have homework. Uh, but I think the first is really understanding uh, the battle rhythm and creating one for themselves uh, is absolutely the first thing to do. And being consistent with executing that and identifying. At least one thing, as uh, I read somewhere um, in a book that says, at least have one thing that you put per day that you're going to mark off your to-do list. One thing and focus on nothing but that one thing for that moment of time. Don't get distractions. And if you do that one thing, 
you need to be comfortable telling yourself, I had a great day. Now, keep going on, but be very satisfied that I did that one thing. So have a battle rhythm, identify every, one thing per day that you can knock off and go do that and feel, um, uh, tell yourself to celebrate that one thing and then move forward. That's an amazing thing to do, Casey. I mean, we're, we're so reactive nowadays with just letting our days be controlled by email and other people's <laughs> priorities, you know, and just we hear it on almost every show. So to tell yourself that you had a great day after accomplishing that one thing. And now, on the, as you're mentioning this, I'm just thinking other things that I could be very grateful for, very happy with <laughs> that I accomplished. But I think we're uh, we're sometimes too hard on ourselves and trying to accomplish way too much and then not self-reflecting on that win. Absolutely. And my, my one thing for today, Saturday, 14 March, my grateful thing is to have a successful podcast with Bo and Luke, and I can mark that off my list. Hey, that that is a great one thing. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll take that and I'll copy that. It's a great podcast with Casey <laughs> Chapadia and, and Luke. I, I I think we've accomplished that. I agree. I totally agree, guys. This is amazing. I, yeah. I, I, let me ask one more thing, Casey. Have you ever? You're like, first of all, you're one of the most humble and selfless men that I've ever talked to. Not even men, man or woman. You, you know, just so selfless and humble. Name one thing that you consistently just take time for, for yourself. What do you do for Casey? Because this entire time we've just been, it blows my mind through your entire life. You're just helping other people and you're not stopping. What do you do for you? <laughs> Ooh, uh, I feel like I'm going to be a hypocrite on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, not enough. Um, uh, I, I do tend to... Uh, self-reflect a lot. I, I, I try to uh, try to tell myself I need to stop, breathe for a minute, but but there's I'm on this crusade that no every second counts and matters, uh, particularly as an early stage of a company. And um, admittedly, my family does tend to uh, get the short change a lot uh, that I do feel guilty for. Um, and it's it's um, emotionally draining. It really is. I, I um, they owe, they, they deserve more. They're just amazing supporters. Um, uh, and so I, I, I like to say that I, for now I take that question and I funnel that answer to celebrate, um, the one person that I would not be doing this without, uh, her support is, is my bride and, uh, you know, military spouses, I say, um, are the toughest substance on earth, our military spouses and, uh, particularly those not only military, but startup, without a doubt, she is my rock. And uh, without uh, her encouragement, picking me up when I need to be picked up um, is is invaluable, invaluable. So I, I take that. And uh, right now I am I am loaning that and giving it to her. Awesome. So here's a huge shout out to Casey's bride. Thank you for <laughs> what you do. Uh, I, I just can't say that enough because it, it means the world. And through that support, um, that support alone is going to lead to the changing of a lot of lives for the better. Thank you so much. So Casey, do you have, um, uh, do you have marketing materials you can share with us? Luke and I would love to, uh, to be able to promote athlete foundry, however we can, uh, and share that message, uh, to, to help your journey. If you have it, share it with us folks. Uh, if you want to learn about athlete foundry directly, you can go to athletefoundry.com. Um, I did notice you also have an app. Um, so I have an Android. Is your app available on Apple devices as well? Absolutely. So uh, we do. Obviously, we have a web. We have an iOS and an Android. Um, we are fully functional on, on the web. It has all the fantastic features. You can create an account, uh, actually create an account on the mobile as well. Um, the features, um, mobile-wise, we haven't turned on all the features just yet. It's about 20 to 30% behind the web. Uh, but in the next two months or so, the web, t the mobile will be all caught up and, uh, and have fully functional. But uh, there's a lot you can do on the mobile. Um, and, uh, but everything you can do on the web, and in just a few months' time, will be all caught up on, on the mobile itself. So my, I, uh, as a lean team, it is marketing material-wise all I can uh, share, and I appreciate both of your willingness to share and spread the the great words of Athlete Foundry is to visit our website, of course, athletefoundry.com, and really check out the story, the powerful video that it's at the front landing page uh, that really 
goes to communicate our passion, which is the family unit and empowering the moms and dads all across America and their student athletes um, to help achieve that American dream. Um, yeah. And then our story, you know, you go down to our the plan section. If you click on the plan, it goes over our, our model. Um, we divine our de- device, design our model across those three pillars and questions. And if you look at those questions across each of those ideas, by the time I get to 12th grade, how do I position my child to answer those questions in the best way for him or her? Well, that takes time. It's not overnight. So that's the reverse plan. And <clears throat> a parent, a coach, a school administrator, no one can argue those questions. Those are absolutely right on questions to say, how do I produce a good child, young adult that is ready to excel and succeed in athletics and beyond? Uh, yeah. And so no one can argue that, that, that that's just, the, those are, those are bulletproof in our opinion. Awesome. Truly. Yeah. I love the video. I think it's very eye catching when you open up your page. Yeah, no, <laughs> it is it's fantastic. You don't, you don't see that a lot, but it's truly, um, yeah, it gets you. Absolutely. You know, which is why we have a great, uh, uh, brand ambassador. If you look at our brand ambassadors, uh, former NFL player, Marcus Ogden, who is an absolutely, uh, amazing, humble human being. Um, has a great story by himself in terms of adversity. Uh, we just brought on Zara Northover, who is an Olympian, uh, female rock star of a, of a human being. Um, and we actually have a, a few more that are in the pipeline that, uh, I, uh, hope to announce in the next one to two months. I'm really, really excited about a few more that are in the pipeline, some new brand ambassadors about using their voice, their story to truly lift and inspire kids to achieve yeah. more in life. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome cause. Awesome company. Awesome person, Casey. Good Lord. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Well, Luke, I think, um, I think it's been another great podcast. Uh, it's been amazing for sure. Without a doubt. Uh, Casey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. And, uh, Hey Luke, I think that's a wrap.